for a prima ballerina. In half an hour, international snooker, when Tony Knowles takes on Eddie Charlton in the second quarterfinal of the UK Masters. First on one, here's Tomorrow's World. So how many sets of golf clubs can you get into a mini? One in the front, one in the back? Wrong. How about three sets in the boot? There we are. Three sets in one that are so light that you wouldn't be worried carrying it to the first tee. So what's the secret? Well, one rather small club and a screw-on handle, which you can use for all the clubs. But you see this clever little lug here? Well, that's a locating lug, and it combats the problems of bunkers. Well, the sand, at least. Because it's specially tapered so that there's a minute gap just around all the joining faces to make sure that no sand or grit runs into the perfect... Uh, to ruin the perfect join. And any sand that is on the thread will also be driven out by the nut. And there's also a similar little gap up here to make sure that it falls out there. So, good solid join, leaving you with no excuses for a bad shot. Going well! Oh. That is your fault. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> All I wanted to say was, how do you get three sets of clubs out of that one bag? Well, the answer lies in the handles. You can choose the size of handle. So whether you're six foot tall or six years old, all you need to buy is a handle, and you can get right into the game. Right. What a perfect woman driver. Well, later in tonight's show, Judith journeys deep into the heart of a Welsh mountain. And in a week when NASA has experienced its greatest ever tragedy, we'll also be examining their forgotten triumph, Voyager's outstanding encounter with the planet Uranus. But first, Howard finds a danger turned to good use in the New Mexican desert. This part of New Mexico doesn't get much rain. But when it does rain, it pours. Those few inches turn into torrents, rushing down the dry arroyos, bringing flash floods. So here on the Rio Grande, they've built a flood control dam. It's five miles long, and with it, it's brought the opportunity for the most unlikely recreational activity to be found in a desert, sailing. Cochiti Lake has become the local ocean for sailors marooned in the nearby desert. Cochiti Lake is surrounded by the Hemes Mountains that can whisk up high winds in a matter of minutes. Although they'll often blow over just as quickly, that's small comfort if you're left capsized. Oh! Especially since all I can do is stand on this hole and pull the writing line. Ugh. Nothing. I'm just not heavy enough because the holes are so far apart. If I could gain a little extra weight, well, I don't have a mountain of chocolate brownies with me, so, uh, well, maybe this will do. Water, this will effectively double my weight, just like having a mate on board. 
So, with two of us... Well, we might make a sailor out of him one day. But look at that, Maggie. Portrait of a real sailor on a real boat. And, uh, oh, look, there's me on the boat again. And, uh, ah, hang on, something wrong there. Stick around, I won't be a second, it'll soon be sorted. Well, oh, God, it's green again. Um, <laughs> I think we've got an excuse here. Now, you may have got out of seeing his pictures, but I'm afraid you're not going to get out of seeing mine. Because I've got technology behind me and 50 snaps on this tiny little disc. So, no messing around here. Open this up, slot that in. And you can now see what life's really like at Tomorrow's World in rehearsal. See, not a lot happens. Doesn't she look a heap without any makeup on? Now, I have to admit that I did have something of a deja vu feeling about all this. But that's because the Japanese have been threatening for over two years to launch an electronic stills camera, which would enable you to take pictures like this straight onto the disc without the need for any processing. Well, they're still working on the camera, but the disc, as you see, has certainly arrived. And you're able to take pictures with an ordinary camera and an ordinary film because the manufacturers have found a way of storing a whole roll of transparencies onto a tiny disc. A video camera converts the picture into a television signal and that is then converted into digits and recorded just like any computer program will be onto a tiny floppy disc just inside that plastic cover there. Now, this is the stage where you can fiddle around with the colour. So if your holiday hasn't turned out to be quite as marvellous as you'd hoped, you can make the skies go blue and you sort of change the tints on it. What's more, these pictures will last forever. They won't fade and they'll never get scratched. And should you ever get fed up with looking at yourself, you can always see what's on the telly. Right, let's just see what Judith's up to. Looking for oil used to be largely a matter of luck. You simply dug and hoped for the best. But finding oil today has become a very complex science. As the larger oil fields run out, exploration means pinpointing smaller, more remote reserves in increasingly difficult locations, like the bottom of the North Sea. Now, oil actually originates from this green soup-like plankton which actually consists of millions of microscopic plants, which are present in the sand and silt on the seabed. Now, this decomposes. It's buried, and as the pressure builds up, it becomes hardened into rock. And as the rock is buried deeper and deeper, the temperature rises, and some of the heated organic material is converted into oil. The problem for oil explorers is that even if they know they've got the right type of rock in the right formation for making oil, they still don't know if it's been heated enough to produce oil in large quantities. But scientists have recently found a clever way of learning the history of a piece of rock. It involves analyzing core samples like these drilled from beneath the seabed. And what they're looking for is the remains of organic material in particular, the remains of the chlorophyll molecules which make plants green. Under high temperatures and pressures, these chlorophyll molecules incorporated in the rock gradually undergo molecular changes. For example, two very small changes, here and here, are enough to alter the color of the molecule from green chlorophyll to red porphyrin. Then further changes will alter the shades of red. So what you've got is a color indicator of how far the organic material has gone along the road to becoming oil.
And you can extract those molecules from small samples by adding solvents. Now, I'm just going to add these solvents to very, very small samples of rock in this special equipment. Now, what we've got in the first one here is mud from the seabed, which has not yet been buried. And as you can see, you're getting a green color there. That is normal chlorophyll. Now, this shale rock collected from 2,000 meters below the North Sea gives a different color. You can see some pale pink just coming through there because the molecules have gone through the initial change from green chlorophyll to red porphyrin. While rocks like this one from deeper down, 3,000 meters below the North Sea, are giving a very different color. You've got a dark red there which means the molecules have undergone even more changes. But finding lots of red pigment like that is not the whole answer. Now, that might look fairly uniform to you and to me, but separate out the molecules in a chromatogram like this, and you can see that there are many different shades of red. Scientists have now isolated and identified so many of these that by measuring the exact amount of each of the different molecules present, you can construct a unique fingerprint for every type of rock. The fingerprints not only show exactly what stage the rock has reached on its way to producing oil, but also reveal which microscopic plants formed the oil all those millions of years ago. And if you happen to own a few acres of ground with this sort of profile, you better start drilling right away. <laughs> After Tuesday's disaster to the Space Shuttle Challenger, every detail of the 1 minute 12 second flight is now being pieced together. It's almost certain that the problem lies not with the orbiter itself, but with the main fuel tank and with the fuel lines which connect it to the body of the shuttle. But whatever the cause of the accident, it now seems probable that the whole shuttle program will be delayed for at least a year, and a number of scientific projects planned to be launched from the shuttle in 1986 will suffer. Astro-1, a probe to meet Halley's Comet and due to leave in March, will almost certainly be scrapped. The orbiter Galileo will also be delayed for at least a year. Destined for Jupiter, this had to leave by May to take advantage of a particular alignment of the planets. Galileo was to be the first spacecraft to go into orbit around Jupiter and to drop a probe into the planet's cloud. But US defense projects will be the hardest hit. Star Wars research won't be much affected, but it was planned to launch two communication satellites and a new spy satellite before the end of the year. They'll now be looking to unmanned launches, like Titan, to get the crucial defense equipment into orbit. The European Ariane launcher is fully booked for the next 18 months, so it won't be able to take on any extra load. Which means investigators at NASA are under extreme pressure to find out what happened and to get the three remaining shuttles flying again. You may remember in last week's programme that we reported on significant levels of aluminium which have been found in some baby feeds. In a report in The Lancet, doctors in Manchester had highlighted what they called a significant risk of aluminium poisoning to premature babies or to babies with defective kidneys. One of the feeds they analysed was a special soya-based feed, Y-soy, which can be used as an alternative to feeds based on cow's milk. They found that this feed had the highest level of aluminium of any of the powdered baby milks they'd tested. Well, since our item, the manufacturers of this baby milk have insisted to us that the product is not intended for premature babies. They also say that out of 25 premature baby units they contacted, only three ever used powdered feeds at all. Well, this appeared to conflict with our own earlier survey on the use of Y-soy. We spoke to 30 out of approximately 250 special care baby units around the country about the feeds they use for premature babies. Over half of the units said they use Y-soy or have used it on premature babies. A further seven said they would use it on premature babies in cases where the baby couldn't take other feeds or if the mother requested it. Seven didn't use the soya-based milk. But even these were not aware that there was any reason not to use the feed on premature babies. They just preferred other products. The confusion seems to be explained by the fact that many of the units use the food in a ready mixed form, not a powder. But the composition is no different. 
So, if Y-soy, in whatever form, is not intended for use in premature baby units, it would seem that the message hasn't reached all the hospitals it should have done. But we must reassure mothers that only premature babies or babies with defective kidneys could be at risk. All the baby feeds are quite safe for full-term babies with normal kidneys. And now back to space again. For years, ships in trouble have had to rely on a mayday distress call transmitted over a conventional radio. But this week, the International Maritime Office has opted for a satellite rescue system, which within 10 years will make the mayday calls a thing of the past. The first component in the system is a new type of radio beacon. In the event of a disaster, it detects a dangerous level of water and frees itself from the ship. It then transmits a coded signal every 50 seconds, which is picked up by a satellite and relayed to an Earth station. Because they know the exact position of the satellite, they can use the Doppler shift produced in the signal from the beacon to pinpoint its exact position and to alert the rescue services. tappers would have you believe that they can tell the condition of train wheels by the sound that this makes. No, I'm not totally convinced by that. And you must admit, you don't see many wheel tappers around these days. But the idea of testing the condition of metal using sound, though not necessarily audible sound, is an accepted part of modern science. And an important and an unusual application of this is being carried out at that enormous power station across the valley. Yes, there really is a power station here, and it is a huge one. It's probably the best concealed of all power stations in the world, and it's certainly the largest of its type in Europe. This is to Norwick, and it's a pump storage station, which means that it works in a very simple way. During the night, when there's no great demand for electricity, water from this lake is pumped 1,700 foot up the mountain to a second lake. Then in the day, when there's a run on electricity, water from that higher lake is allowed to pour down through turbines, which generate the much-needed electricity. And all the workings are hidden inside that mountain. <laughs> generators are all down below. There are six generators here, which between them can produce as much electricity as the largest normal power station. When there's a demand for electricity, they go from just ticking over to being at full power in 10 seconds, and they do that up to 30 times a day. So why am I telling you this? Well, it's to give you some idea of the enormous strain, but water pipes like this one have to go through. Over here, we've got a water inlet valve, and beyond that is a pipe going right up to the lake above. At the moment, that valve is closed, but once it opens, the immediate pressure change in water pipes like this is enormous. And imagine that happening up to 30 times a day, 365 days a year, year after year. If just one of the wells should fail in a pipe, the whole of this power station would be flooded. The simplest way to test those wells is to use ultrasound, as Mike is doing now. Thanks very much. And this acts rather like the wheel tapper, only this is both his hammer and his ear. If you look at it closely, one half of the head here is the transmitter that sends out high-frequency ultrasound. The other side of the head is the receiver that listens for that sound. 
but is not interested so much in the quality of the sound, but how fast it comes back and in what direction. For example, is the sound being reflected from the outside of the walls, or is it being reflected back sooner from some tiny imperfection? Mike, using one of these things, how long would it take you to test all of the welds in all of the pipes? Well, it couldn't. It's just impossible. So, this is the answer. A machine that does the ultrasonic sensing under remote control. It's got a number of those heads, like the ones we were looking at in here, plus some jets that squirt out a lubricating jelly so that very close contact can be established. The whole thing is controlled by computer. It just works away in these tunnels automatically, following the wells that go down and along all the pipes. Of course, the machine can't stay in the pipes, so it's broken down into small enough pieces to go up this manhole. Information from all the probes is fed into a computer and you get a, an image of the pipe wall. For example, there are two vertical welds and a horizontal weld. And you can tweak this equipment here until you get the sort of colors that are most helpful in picking up potential problems. For example, that could be a blemish in the pipe wall just there. So we'll look at a more detailed image and there is a small blemish although this pipe would be considered sound it's important though because you can store the picture in the computer's memory that you could in the future compare this to another picture taken say in six years time when the pipes are examined again and you could then check this area for any important and potentially dangerous changes we have come a long way since the wheel I wonder how many double bases you can get into a mini. Oh, forget it. Didn't want, didn't want two of those anyway. My uh, other double base is a mini. Just plug it into uh, any ordinary roadside amplifier and turn on. And it sounds like a bass guitar. But it's only a fraction of the size. And the secret lies in the rubber-like strings. They're up to 10,000 times more elastic than the steel, which is normally used, which means you can use much shorter strings at a reduced tension and still produce rich, deep notes at the same frequency. Movements of the strings are picked up directly by a transducer in contact with the strings, and it converts their vibrations into electrical signals. So, uh, let's uh, give it a go, eh? Oh, I don't think I'll go on with that anymore. Maggie? <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> Well, the last few years have seen a growing awareness that for a healthy diet, meat should have less fat. And one of the ways farmers have responded to this is by using steroids, which speed growth and in the process make the meat leaner. However, the EEC is threatening to impose a total ban on the use of growth-promoting hormones. So farmers are now worrying about how to keep their cows in trim. Well, a totally novel approach uses the animal's own immune system to attack excess fat. And in the future, it could even be used to attack the extra inches on our own waistlines. Unlike steroids, the methods leave no unnatural substances in the meat. Now, what happens is that the fat is attacked with a special type of antibody produced synthetically, a monoclonal antibody. Normally, the immune system attacks foreign invaders in the body. Antibodies attach themselves to the intruder and signal for help to the body's defense system, which then destroys the foreign cell. But the new antibody is designed to attack fat cells. And here they are, the sac-like cells which make up fat tissue. Now, interestingly, when you put on fat, you don't so much create new cells as stretch existing ones. Now, the idea is to use a calculated dose of antibody to destroy a certain number of cells. Now, that's important because you do need some fat in the body. And once destroyed, these cells are very slow to regenerate. So with less fat storage space, the animal produces more muscle and more protein instead. Present statistics show that for every pound of lamb produced, two thirds of it is meat, and roughly one third of it is excess fat, stripped away before the meat even reaches the shops. And that excess fat from livestock costs 400 million pounds per year in the United Kingdom alone. 
This new method would mean that 30% of that waste fat would become lean meat. They're also running tests to check for any adverse effects. But if these prove to be negligible, the meat industry could be on to a winner. And so could anyone with a weight problem. Because theoretically, the research could go one stage further and be used to curb human obesity. But first, they've got to make sure that the released fat doesn't clog up the arteries, which could, of course, increase the risk of heart attacks. In the meantime, I'll stick to the diet. Last week, after eight years in space, Voyager 2 kept its rendezvous with Uranus. It's already over 10 million kilometers beyond the planet, hurtling out further into space. The full implications of the masses of data that the robot spacecraft radioed back to Earth won't be worked out for months. But the discoveries this past week have been dramatic. The five outer moons, which had been the merest smudges when viewed by the most powerful telescopes on Earth, could be seen in fantastic detail. Here is the moon Ariel, only around a thousand kilometers across. It has every sort of geological feature known to man. Giant mountains, valleys some 10 miles deep, and channels which seem to have been etched by flowing liquid. Even a number of volcanoes. Those same channels can be clearly seen on Miranda, the closest moon of Uranus. Remember, though, that although the surface looks like rock, it's most probably methane ice. This is Titania, also scarred by massive canyons, thought to be caused either by the powerful gravity of Uranus disrupting the surface, or else some unknown heat source inside the moon. But as well as the five known moons, Voyager discovered ten new ones, eight of them in orbit outside the barely visible rings of the planet. Now, it's hardly surprising that the new moons haven't been seen because they're very dark and comparatively small, ranging from 200 down to about 20 kilometers in diameter. This one is less than 150 kilometers across. But while the new moons are dark, the jet black rings reflect about 5% of the light which hits them, even though they're probably made of methane ice, which you'd think was highly reflective. So the blackness was a mystery. What seems to have happened is that the methane molecules in the ring debris seem to have been chemically altered into long-chain organic molecules, rather like tar. So the boulders in the rings and in the new moons may be like large black frozen tar balls. Now finally, even though Voyager flew close by, the planet itself still remained a massive featureless ball of greenish gas. But the heat-sensitive cameras told a different story. They picked up huge ultra-cold cloud masses swirling about across the surface. So what would it be like to stand on the surface of Uranus? First of all, you'd be underneath hundreds of miles of dense swirling clouds of greenish gas. You'd be in a continuous chemical snowstorm. And you'd be crunching across a packed ice cocktail of ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. And the whole thing would be at around minus 213 degrees centigrade. That's a full 140 degrees colder than a bad night in Antarctica. But although the surface is so cold, the discovery of a magnetic field around the planet suggests that beneath the surface, there must be a much hotter core, probably of hydrogen. At such enormous pressure, it's behaving like a metal, rotating like a huge dynamo to generate the field. Uniquely in the solar system, the magnetic north pole is angled at 55 degrees from the geographical north pole. A bit like having the magnetic north pole here on Earth, somewhere in Spain. Now, scientists are baffled by this. One of the world's experts told us, I could explain it, but I wouldn't believe my own explanation. Now, while they analyze the results, Voyager 2 has been slung around Uranus by its gravitational field and accelerated further out into space. It's now traveling 4,000 miles an hour faster than it was when it arrived, speeding on to a rendezvous with Neptune in August 1989, after another three lonely years of travel. We'll be back rather sooner, next week in fact, so until then, good night.